very much. Thank you very much, Lorraine. It's a great pleasure to be here and to open up this uh, seminar of the Imaging Initiative of EPFL on Imaging the Planet for a Sustainable Future. I'll try to be brief because I'm between you and the interesting stuff. So let me simply say that climate change is of course a central uh, topic at EPFL. It's the biggest challenge I believe for humanity today. Uh, sometimes people say, okay, how about the COVID-19 pandemic? I say, yeah, it's going to be over when the vaccine will be here. So time horizon, you know, a uh, few months or a couple of years, climate change is something that is on the horizon of generations. That's why it's so hard to actually deal with it and tell, you know, the world uh, in some sense that there is an emergency just as big as the one with COVID-19. And in that context, monitoring climate change is absolutely central. And of course, imaging is central to monitoring. And um, from that point of view, as an Institute of Technology, we're very excited to participate in monitoring climate change, but also in finding solutions to fight climate change. So uh, seeing the climate change uh, changing is of course central to awakening you know, the general population to necessary changes in our behavior, in our consumption, in our energy. Uh, generation and so on. Uh, but what we also need to provide, of course, are engineering and science solutions so we can effectively fight climate change. And there is a long list of things here uh, that I don't want to go over. Today, it's about monitoring. And of course, when you do monitoring, you collect huge amounts of data. And certainly, uh, Earth observation is one of the biggest producer, uh, producer of data. And uh, once you say large amounts of data, you talk about data science, machine learning, AI, and so on. Things which are of central interest at EPFL, also central to the imaging initiative at EPFL. So with these very few words, I would like to thank Professor Gilberto Camara for giving this lecture and also thank all the organizers for running this very interesting seminar series. And I wish you an excellent uh, seminar and panel discussion. Thank you very much. So I have the impossible task of summarizing Gilberto's career in, in a couple of minutes, because uh, it is quite something. So I'll try to be brief and give some, some highlights here and there. So Gilberto Camara is a professor at INPE, which is the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. And he was the, the director for Earth Observation at INPE in 2001, uh, between 2001 and 2005. And then he became actually the director of the whole INPE in between 2006 and 13. He is now the secretar secretariat director of the group of Earth Observations, so GEO. And uh, this is a, a group that has, has a mission to facilitate the access to Earth observation data internationally and to coordinate international efforts in, in Earth observation at large, and also supports all kinds of new missions, new sensor, new, new needs for the Earth observation in industry and to support science. All his career, he, he has devoted it to the, to the support of open data science he was beyond, beyond, behind creating the Remote Sensing Data Center of IMPE, which is not nothing, and also uh, a number of effort in uh, the monitoring of the forestation in the, in the Amazon. I, I'm pretty sure you will be talking about it at some point, but uh, in your talk today, which is on the challenges of machine learning in earth observation to basically respond to the big, big questions of, uh, of the future, like fighting climate change or the loss of biodiversity. Gilberto, I'm very pleased to have you here and I'm looking forward to, to hear your talk. Yes, uh, thank you, David, and thank you all uh, at EPFL for a fantastic opportunity to talk with the scientists of this such a prestigious institute. Uh, for me, it's an enormous honor to be invited to meet you and to exchange some views with you. So this is going to be both, um, let's say, a description of what is happening, but also uh, hopefully some discussions that might think about what we do for the future. So let's now try this. 
oops, not end of slideshow. What is this? So it's this, no, go right, sorry. Okay. Yes, so I suppose that, I uh, hope you all can see. So thanks again, EPFL for helping, you know, having me uh, talk today. So let's discuss first the general perspectives that we have. Uh, obviously, as uh, Professor Vettely sp spoke very well, we have a clear, you know, crisis in our hands and a challenge enormously. So because it's these, uh, the, we talk about climate change, but in fact, it's a whole tempest of, of crisis. It's the crisis have to do with urbanization, uh, the food, the food, the availability of water, the crisis of inequality. And this is all to do with a tremendous change that has been happening, not only with climate change, but related to it in the last, uh, let's say four or five decades. And one of the issues of Earth observation is helping understand these three questions, where are changes taking place, how much change is happening, who is being impacted, what might happen later. So essentially, uh, the power of first observation is related to our ability, depending on the problem we're facing, to answer some of these questions. How much has changed? Who is uh, where is the change taking place, which is crucial for decision? Uh, when was the change taken? And uh, who is causing the change? And this is a map of, uh, uh, obviously, a place which is very dear to me. This is Brazil. This is actually the Amazon forest. And in red, this is the everything that has been deforested uh, until some years ago. It's still a little, there's, it's unfortunately it's getting worse. This is measured by my institute, the National Institute of Space Research. And we also do a lot of work to support policy uh, making, including, for example, supporting Brazil's uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement. Still, uh, there are gaps. Uh, there are gaps because although global Earth observation is available, uh, our ability to use uh, such data is still uh, beyond what we need. So this, for example, is the data from the Global Carbon Project, which is one of the scientific most respected groups that uh, discusses the carbon budget. This is the estimates of uh, emissions from land use change. Uh, and you see the size of the error bar. The size of the error bar is enormous. So there is lots of uncertainty about how much emissions are taking place out of land use change. We can say a lot, but this is obviously not a scientific response. And exactly the measure and what needs to be done and why is it happening, what is the pace of the change is significant and this is a real problem with us. Uh, we can see that the nations have fortunately agreed to a timeline. This is uh, data, this is the uh, slide from uh, UNFCCC. The idea here is that you have an international agreement, which, which is the Paris Agreement, which states that you have to report your progress towards achievement of the goals every two years. Uh, starting on 2023, we're going to have a global stock take to see where we are. Every five years, we'll do so. This will have recommendations to member states, all countries. We'll have to revise national measures. This was true for all countries, like, for example, Switzerland, and include adaptation plans and mitigation plans. And this is the, the, the role of Paris Agreement. And you can imagine that the contributions from science and technology are tremendous at every point, improving the national measures, improving the global stock take, uh, recommending what are the plans which are most effective. So there is plenty, plenty of, of opportunities for science in the, the, let's say, general framework that we call the Paris Agreement. But, uh, we still have, as I said, a number of uncertainties. There are, uh, this is a data from uh, Homan Quest et al. in Biogeoscience 2016, and you have a sense 
of places where there's a lot of uncertainty. In Brazil, tropical forests in the Congo, a lot of it in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. There's a lot that we don't know, and hopefully a lot that Earth observation can do. But beyond emissions, there's also the consequences of climate change would have to do with increased uh, problems with food supply and availability of water and all that comes into it. The other point that GEO is pushing, and now it's back to why, is there is an, an institution called GEO. Uh, it's because this institution is one, let's say, indirect consequence of the, uh, the Earth Summit in Rio 92, which created the three big conventions, the Convention on Biodiversity, the Convention on Desertification, and the Convention on Climate Change, and established principles by which we uh, all the let's say United Nations global change uh, environment works and one of them is the principle of the availability of transparency which states that environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all citizens as each individual should have appropriate access to information concerning the environment perhaps in Switzerland which you have you have referendums every almost every week it appears uh, the participation of citizens is something which is taken for granted. I will tell you that's not the case everywhere, and the information about the environment is not transparent everywhere. But this is another goal that GEO has, is pushing information uh, to everyone. The way we do, we promote open data, and we support communities. So we have a community that works on agriculture, a community that works in the forest, a community that works in water, a community that works on desertification, on land degradation. And these communities promote the use of Earth observation data to generate results which are used by member states in support of the Convention of Climate Change, the Disaster Risk Reduction Agreements, and of course, the sustainable development goals. One product, one example, I'm not going, going to much detail, but this is the GeoGlam, Global Agriculture Monitoring. And this is essentially using satellite data for crop condition assessment. In other words, you can tell with some months in advance, what are the conditions for crops? And these are the major crops in Africa, in other countries, and what are the situations where there is a failure of the crop, where there's good conditions, where they are, need to be watched. And this is a product that is uh, regularly produced. And the leader researchers, this is not, you can say, ah, who's doing it? And actually, it's a group of researchers uh, led by the University of Maryland in the United States. So people who know Chris Justice, a very well-known researcher in remote sensing. And he's, he's leading a team that does this work. Uh, so I don't have to tell you that. I suppose that you are converted to the cause of full and open access to data. Uh, but you know, we always remember that without it, you cannot have global sustainable development. What has happened more recently, and a lot of it is also due to the decision of Europe to fund a major program on Earth observation satellites, the so-called Copernicus program, is now that we have data that we never had before. So it's, it's an immense amount of data, which is imaging uh, the Earth. And is perhaps, uh, perhaps the astronomers will always tell anything that you have, we have 10 times, 100 times. But other than the astronomers, what we have now is fifth, more than 15 terabytes a day of open, uh, open old data. And this comes from satellites from Europe, from the US, from Brazil, from China, from Japan. And, and there's a lot of data. So what do you do with it? Well, the first consequence of that is that we're moving the goalpost. We actually moving the way uh, Earth observation people are working with data because it's unfeasible to deal with big data in the lab situation. Maybe in EPFL, who is very rich and has, you know, has the ability to buy a lot of, but for most uh, mortal humans, you have to, to no longer 
have data in your laptop or in your computer, you have to use the cloud. So you have to deal with data in the cloud and there are a full amount of, of possibilities that come into it. You can analyze much more data, a full amount of problems that come into it. You actually back to the, what I called, the, the Europeans call the GAFA, I prefer the MAGI, which is Microsoft, Apple, Google, and IBM, the big cloud providers of uh, data who have Earth observation. But there is no choice. I mean, you have to move the users to the data. And in fact, this is what's happening in a lot of areas of IT, the new digital economy where you have uh, big data, uh, very low access cost, and massive use, at least certainly not yet on Earth's observation, but in anything, lots of things spatial we used to be, you know, you had to buy a license of a software so and so, now you have it at the tip of your smartphone. So essentially, uh, the, the there are lots of problems here, technological problems, for example, how do you design a good API? Part of the success of technologies such as Android is that they design a very good API or uh, app store from Apple, uh, very good APIs that make it easy for you to smart, start a small company that develops a certain app. And we're still lacking this on Earth observation. A lot of work has gone into research, but very little into this harmonization. This is on the positive side. There is much that is available now to uh, researchers worldwide who have access to the cloud. And one of the issues is the cost of entry has decreased. What's the cost of entry? What do you need to start working? And one of the geo, as we actually have partnerships with Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, uh, by these partnerships, we're giving uh, grants, meaningful grants to researchers worldwide from Indonesia to Peru, to Colombia, to Belize, to Indonesia to Nepal uh, there to have access to clouds without payment so they can use it from their laptops. And so this allows a possibility of, let's say, focusing on the mindware, not on the hardware. Now, the problem with the mindware is that our community, and when I say our, I mean the Earth Observation slash remote sensing community, has a problem, has a serious problem. The problem of our community, and I don't say it's imaging as a whole, I'm taking the one I work with, the GI, geoinformatics and so on. We don't share. We know what is needed to share. You know, we, you cannot only publish, you have to publish and do your code, your data, your executable to allow full replication. Maybe some of you are familiar with the conference called IGARS, International Geoscience and Remote Sensing Conference. I, last year, I was invited to give a keynote in Japan. And there were, was it 13,000? Was it? No, 1,300. 13,000 people, 15,000 people, about 1,300 papers. And I went through them searching how many of these papers had anything shared, like uh, share the data or share the code. You know what the answer was? Less than 30. So you, and I was looking at uh, journals like remote sensing, remote sensing of environment. The number of uh, people who share that data is very small and share the software even smaller, which means that progress at the global level is stalled by this lack of open source. The problem is that the, now going back, going more to the technical side, we have a huge issue before us. When we say we want to use information technology to support sustainable development, you have to be very careful because the experience we have on the issues like machine learning does not adapt well to the real world. So when we say a forest, 
People say, oh, there's a forest. I'm going to develop a software that measures forest. And the question would be, which forest are you talking about? You have tropical forests, lush. You have temperate forests, very low on biodiversity. You have dry forests, which I actually have no leaves almost nine months a year and three months a year when it rains become very, very green. But you have planted forests. What forests are you talking about? Is one size fit for all? So we use words, and there is, I mean, of those who like, I have good friends on the ontology area, which I used to work with. And, 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 and effectively, our words in, in, in the language, whatever language we have, fail to really account for the, the, the richness of, of the actual nature. The other thing, we are very bad traditionally in imaging, at least on its time. We normally take one set of image at one particular time and classify it. Whilst uh, the real things which are interested are change. And change is say you have a pristine forest where someone goes there, degrades by logging, and then puts fire and finally does the clear cut. And all of these are events that happen in time. So there's a long discussion on what are you actually measuring? So how do you actually cl classify a forest? So a lot of researchers from non, let's say, informatics background, non-technological backgrounds, have been looking at the problem. So this is Robin Chadson from the United States published this paper. I think it was at a global change biology, but there was an environmental journal saying, well, forests are different. There is a forest one where the natural dynamics are maintained. The forest two, with there is an event of deforestation. There's trajectory four, which is you cut the forest and then four goes back to regeneration. And therefore, uh, we have in we, we images, we like to look at images, we like to see the colors, but in fact, a lot of information is on the time series. And therefore, this is a note paper of mine from COSIT, Conference on Spatial Information uh, Theory, where I would say, well, a remote sensing image is actually a measurement of snapshots of change trajectories. Used to be the case when images were expensive that we got only one. But today, we have much, much more. Though we are in the age of big data. So what do we do with big data? And then I don't know how many, I suppose in EPFL, there's no such people, but I always met, meet people who come out with say, uh, what can science learn from Google? And, uh, and who believe on this credo, oh, all oh, models are wrong. And increasingly you can succeed without them, like Google would say. Well, <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that. And for the astronomers, I suppose, I hope there's some astronomers in the room because I'm going to quote from a the astronomer royal, who all of you would know, Sir Martin Rees. And Sir Martin has written a nice uh, piece on this uh, online magazine called Aeon, which I like very much. And he, he says, black holes are simpler than force and size has its limits. So, I mean, the problems are all imaging, but he says, the complexity of force is much more difficult to deal with our conventional scientific tools than, let's say, understanding black holes and understanding gravitational waves. Not that it's the men, I mean, are fantastic. The gravitational wave detection is absolutely fantastic. But the problem is expressing that complexity in equations, it's much more complicated. And let me just, not going to go in much detail, but it's, um, it's, I'm sorry. Essentially, what we're trying to do, and when you get big data, is to say, okay, I have big data, and I have signatures of time. So each pixel has a time change. And I, let's say the typical recipe would be, you extract your samples from, you organize a data cube, which is already lots of problems. You extract samples from the data cube, you train a machine learning model, 
and you classify the time series. So this would be like a first approach to big data on, on Earth's observation, a big, bigger Earth's observation. And then the problems start. Yes, you have to obtain the data. You, uh, RD is a jargon we use for analysis of the data. Uh, you have to put in a cloud collection. You have to build so-called data cube. And you have to select the machine learning methods. But the problem is on this right side, training data, quality control. What actually is behind these words? And in fact, I actually had a naive view until about five years ago, I started actually writing code. So in my spare time, between Saturdays and Sundays and nights, I'm a programmer. And this is much better than being a director of anything. Coding is fantastic. The hacking is fun. So this is something I've been working. And this not only allowed me to deliver something, but also to learn a lot. And to learn, and, and for you, it's called SITS, image time series analysis in R. And uh, it's on GitHub. So if you type SITS, satellite image times analysis, you, you get there. But what, what is that uh, we've learned, and I've learned, and of course the community has learned. Okay, so this is the tools that have been Gil recommended. Gilberto, I'm, I'm sorry, we're having some trouble with, with your sound. Um, I, I suggest you go ahead a bit and, and we'll see. Uh, I'll tell you if it uh, gets better, but uh, just to-, to Well, move. let me see. Uh, let me see a moment. It is, excuse me. It should be, is it, is it bad as it was? Yeah, I think it's your, your connection maybe. Um. I am, I'm in trouble because my connection used to be good, but, and but, I don't but, have. But, no, go, go ahead. And, and I guess it's already better now. So, so sorry about that. It's, it comes and goes. I mean, yeah, you can blame Swisscom for that, but so it's okay. So. I'm sorry about this, uh, usually works, but uh, so I'm uh, what I was talking about is that there is the recipe for big yield data is pick up huge amount of data sets, organize them so they are cons in consistent observations that we call data cubes and run through some machine learning technique. Brrr. And and we can even, this is the image uh, from, from uh, Google, which says, okay, this is the analogy to a recipe. You have your data, you have your algorithm, you have your models, and then you have your pizza, your predictions. If only it were be simple. Well, one thing that we can benefit from is that there are at present no specific methods which have been tailored for machine learning and nurse observations. So clearly um, a lot of what is being done recently is actually drawn from the community at large. So it's by the, you know, either the Hasty book, Goodfellow book or things that come there. So the traditional SVMs from ranging from XVM to extreme gradient to deep learning, LSTS, well, whatever. All of these that you know, convolution neural networks and so on. But we should ask ourselves a question. What works for face recognition, automatic translation and chess and go does also work for big spatial data. What makes uh, AI machine learning work for, 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 for cats and dogs? And why would it not work? Well, it all boils down to the problem I'm sure most of you know, when the variability is relatively small, it's a piece of cake for machine learning. But when the variability of the data is hard, it's tough for machine learning to anticipate. Because as basically optimization techniques, which they are one way or another, they work best on problems with low variability. And we have 
like the, the Americans used to say, an elephant in the room. And in this case, the elephant is an elephant, a real elephant. What do I say about a real elephant? It, because the Brazilian savannas don't have elephants. And the African savannas, although people say it's savannas, they have elephants. It is a long story why one is the other, but never mind. Uh, the point here is they're not the same thing. And if you think you have an algorithm who classifies all savannas in the globe with fantastic machine learning, uh, okay, well, good luck. Uh, and, and so it's really by recognizing the importance of local knowledge that we, we can start to understand why forests, why savannas are so complex. They are very complex ecosystems. So take one example, our savanna. So it's Brazil, we call it Cerrado, by the way. It covers uh, 2 million square kilometers, a huge area, with airs ranging from five degrees north, south to 25 degrees south. So this is a huge area. I can, you can imagine how many Switzerland will be there. And uh, you want to classify it. Then the first thing you have to do is to get the experts. Oh, the experts tell this. And so, oh, but they'll say, oh, it's not a savanna, but there are parts of this savanna. And actually, if you see the beta image on the bottom, what we call a savanna or a Brazilian uh, savanna, the Cerrado, it's actually a continuum from, from gallery forest to dry forest to woodlands to areas with some we call park savannas, which like an English park that you walk in the grass and there are some trees, I'm sorry, up to areas which are more grasslands. And all, all of that is there. So, you know, and you have to be really uh, understand the ecology before you can start doing things. And, and the ecology affects not only the natural, but the actual, uh, also the culture, the cropland. So this is a very interesting case. This is actually an article which is in press uh, by one of my PhD students. So let me tell you what the story we have, uh, what we're talking about here is uh, something like 65,000 samples of, uh, of uh, time series. Each time series has 23 um, points in the year, so every 16 days, and with uh, four bands. So if you multiply four times 23, you get something like a 96 dimensional space. And uh, to reduce this to something more visible, we use uh, uh, self uh, uh, SOMs. So essentially self-organizing maps. And the idea, and, and actually the idea is interesting, is that uh, as uh, Kohonen used to say, uh, the things which are near on the 96 dimensional space are also near in the sun most of the time. But then you get things like this. You get the sample here, which is this neuron 2040 with lots of samples, 184 samples, with soy corn. So there's soy and there's corn. So soy is planted in October and then people collect the soy, sell it to the Europeans to, to feed your pigs and your chicken, and then uh, come up with corn, which is also sold to the Chinese and so on. And you say, okay, so people, if you ask an expert, he'll tell you this is soy corn. And if you ask an expert, this is also soy corn. But <laughs> and then we said, oh, how can these be too different? Then we went to look at where these samples come from. It turns out that this uh, sample here, Neuron 240, comes from this region here, which is shown in red, and the other ones come the region which is shown in yellow. And in fact, they have two different climate regimes. And there's less rain, uh, there's less humidity from April to July, which means that the corn doesn't grow as strongly as in April to July. How do you know this if you don't know the uh, agriculture of the system? First of all, you need a lot of work, not just to throw things into machine learning, but in this case, 
to do things like quality control of your samples. And, and in this case, we use some, but could use another things. The other thing is lots of papers, lots of papers we publish, and I'm guilty as charged, uh, come up with this famous K fold validation. And I'm now, you know, when I get, don't send it to me because I'm going to send it back and say, well, this is wrong. This is another example of uh, how much do you want to fool yourself? It's like, you know, Snow White and the, the, the what is the, 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 the queen, right? Who asked, which is the most beautiful woman in the world? Oh, it's me, it's me. No, 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 it's Snow White. So look at this. You have 33,000 samples from the Amazon. And we run these through K-fold validation of uh, support vector machines, random forest, uh, deep learning, simple deep learning, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, has net. Everybody gives you 90 fractures. So don't, don't tell me that 97 is different from 99. You're fooling yourself. This is, this is a good way to be fooled. And in fact, just last week, maybe you have heard uh, came out a, two weeks ago, a paper from Google talking about under specification. I think it's a paper which is in, in Archiv. It's been, it's been mentioned in the MIT technology review and stating we have a serious problem with under specification. In other words, we don't know if the model works or not. We throw the model at their training data, it works fine, but two models trained with this the same training data sets, but a little bit of different parameters will perform completely different real world data. And I, uh, that's very interesting what Google's telling us. Uh, and this is obviously based on real life. So we have a problem. Our optimization techniques, which are our state of the art, do not understand the elephant that is in the room. So there is a tremendous challenge for those of you who want to link nature with, with these latest technologies of making those work. It's not, I'm telling you from experience, it's not picking up convolutional neural networks out of the box and running. That's too easy, but that's not gonna solve the problem, at least not solve it in a way that we can be trust completely the result. So to end up, I think I'm already in my half an hour. So uh, what does the global community need? We are in for a change and obviously a place of learning and the place of high, uh, high education like a PFL can make a difference in the world. We know that the challenge is we need to move the data to the open cloud, the, the data is moved there but that has created a completely new challenge on how to use this data sets and how to make sense of it. And moreover, how to share so that people in the world can actually benefit from the work. And this also is not only a scientific challenge, but also a societal challenge. And I would actually an ethical challenge for all of us scientists. We have learned from COVID it doesn't matter if you say something, you're gonna to have to show your data and I'm gonna to have to analyze before I adopt your vaccine. So I think this is very positive that this practice is, is, should be in, is now in the, in the health community, but should be extended to our community. So I'll leave you with the vision and if you want to learn more, there's a nice paper, discussion paper prepared by uh, the UN uh, environment talking about the digital ecosystem from the environment. Global idea is something that we all share, is how could we develop this global ecosystem from the environment that would be accessible to citizens, to governments, to the private sector, to international organizations. And I'm sure that uh, the high top schools like EPFL have a huge contribution to, to that. So thank you very much and well, looking well, uh, welcoming to your questions. Uh, et si vous pouvez faire des questions en français, c'est bon pour moi aussi. Merci, thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Gilberto. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you maybe a little bit provocative, provocative question about uh, the a part of, uh, of the, the current type of discussion I hear often that we have so many data and that there are data everywhere and now we need only algorithms and machine learning, which I mean, I'm basically shooting on my own <laughs> lab by saying that. But don't you think that, I mean, even though there are all this data around, I mean, access to this data is not so simple always. And there is also all the question of literacy of how to, how to access this data and how to access the right one and how to freely access it. So, I mean, what can small player like universities and have access to all this and know where to find the right information? Well, this is a serious problem, but I think this is the, I mean, what we've seen basically the following. Google Earth Engine, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but has made uh, available for free for research, a lot of data and you can use, I mean, there's limitations on, on what you can do with the API, but what's there is very good. It's very good and it shows the power of, of uh, actually what you can do with big data at the very, means it's very accessible. If you want to go beyond that, you probably are looking at Amazon. Unfortunately, we don't have any good example in Europe we have in Switzerland, you have the Swiss data cube from uh, Greg Giuliani at University of Geneva, which is very interesting. So if you think only Switzerland, there is a good work on Greg Giuliani who has amassed the Swiss data cube. And I don't know exactly what are the conditions for access, but I imagine that should be accessible for researchers. Uh, but if you want to go global, essentially you have to have a subscription to Amazon. But, and, but in fact, uh, if you are logged in the machine, if you access there, this is not the end of the world. It's much more difficult. I think the, the concerning globally, what the, the hard part is the understanding of the mathematical, um, re, well, the relation between the mathematics of the data, in other words, the quantitative aspects of uh, the statistics, the spatial aspects of it, the spatial biases in normal statistics, but also how that, uh, how this has to be interpreted on the light of ecological knowledge. So this is much more difficult because it requires an interdisciplinary team. And I understand that by putting together the, your imaging group, you actually recognize the need to go interdisciplinary. And I think that you are very much to praise for that because it's impossible for someone with just a mathematical background without the ecological uh, underpinning to really understand what the data. So I think this for me is, is, is the most challenging part. Uh, do you think that we are uh, even close to, to this hybrid modeling that it's so much on the verge? I mean, are we beyond curve fitting? Are we understanding causation? Are we understanding process? No, of course no. not. And I mean, I mean, if you even look at the, and the problem is, if you look at the critics, if you look at Judy Appel, for example, he comes up with a very strong criticism, but his solutions are not really being, I mean, they've been not being test proofed. I mean, there's interesting his discussions, but uh, on his book on causality is who was interesting discussions, but you feel the need for something that is demonstrably practical, other than examples of, of, of a garden or whatever, uh, uh, sprinklers. So uh, I think that the, this is, look at it positively. There's job for us for the next decade or so so it's going to be a good challenge for uh, for the scientists to tackle. So I'm, I'm, I think I think this is the, the good thing about talking to EPFL. This is a, a real scientific challenge. That's great. They were not out of job. M Meredith, what do you think? Is a uh, if, if I remember well, you, you're more from an ecology genetics background. Yes. Actually, I think that I can uh, tag on quite nicely to your conversation. So my background is in chemical ecology and genetics. Uh, and I find myself now in the remote sensing laboratories at the University of Zurich. And uh, I 
got involved in remote sensing because I was tired of um, getting my knowledge about ecology by crawling around on the ground from plant to plant and taking lots of samples and then doing analyses, which, you know, in total to analyze the data and interpret it then uh, cost a year. And uh, I saw these magical images <laughs> and <laughs> wanted to help bridge this gap because in my opinion, there's not nearly enough data and I, I get very frustrated um, hearing this idea. I know that, that there, there are a lot of data out there, uh, clearly, and more than ever before in an increasing amount. Um, but anybody, I think, who has some knowledge of the complexity of ecosystems, and I appreciated how you um, introduced this point in several ways, uh, also in ways that make it clear when you're, when you're simply looking at RGB images that there's so much complexity to interpret, um, knows that we, we are so data poor. We have so little understanding of um, the biological mechanisms that generate biodiversity uh, and that maintain it um, and that are involved in the kinds of feedbacks that we would like to understand and predict. Uh, we have so little information about how the organisms that we care increasingly about uh, conserving or, or cultivating work on their own. Um, and so I would like to know um, as somebody who still goes out into the fields and crawls around or jumps around or climbs and <laughs> collects lots and lots of samples and then goes back and analyzes them in a the lab, um, what do you think are the, the data that we can provide uh, that are the most important, that are the most important missing links to the sorts of interpretations uh, that, that we would like to make? And also how can we do it best so that it can be connected to earth observation data? Well, this is a very good question, uh, and uh, I don't have a clear answer, Mary. I can tell you what has been happening with my people in Brazil, because we have the same challenges. In fact, the time for processing data on the cloud, I would say, oh, I can process two million square meter, two square million kilometers in five days. Is this a lot or is this, is this fast? And they say, well, of course, uh, I, I take five months to get the actual samples. So the processing is not a problem. So one of the things we found is that it is hard for the ecological, let's say, the ecology geographer researchers or forest researchers to understand what it means, uh, the in situ ground truth. I mean, collecting a sample. Because when you're dealing with, normally you I mean traditional remote sensing guys actually pick up a drone or pick up a plane or helicopter or drive to the field and say, oh, here there's a forest and here there's a field and here there's this. And of course it doesn't matter too much the algorithm here. You have to tell what has happened the last year, for example, the last two years. And actually because you want to differentiate regimes, for example, of spring and summer and and rainy season, wet season, you actually would like the guys to understand that when they provide you with information about a certain area, they should provide you also with the, what are we talking about in terms of time? Because if you say, well, this is degradation and, and, and okay, but if I know this degradation happened in the last six months and before there was a forest, the time series that would relate to that place is different from a place which being degraded for the last five years. So, and, and, and if you just put them on the same box, uh, you're just going to fool the algorithm or to make the algorithm converge to a stupid uh, answer, which is more likely that they will, he'll give you an answer, but which is meaningless from the uh, ecological point of view. So we find that uh, we also have a lot of discussions with our friends on the ecological side to say, look, don't provide me with these points this way. I cannot, I can, and don't, if you provide them, don't, don't complain about the result. It's your fault. It's like, you know, it's, it's in, the, in the end, it's their fault. The algorithms all are fantastic given that you get the right data, but who has the right data? Yeah, it's true, the algorithms are as good as the data you train them on, so. <laughs> 
I have one more point related to this. So something that's uh, been discussed a lot, of course, in my community is concerns about how we will manage to share digital information going forwards um, in a way that is um, compatible with the Nagoya protocol and the need to respect um, and include local knowledge about all kinds of ecological information that we be that we may be collecting and this is maybe at the moment most discussed for genetic information but it's clear from the Nagoya protocol and the discussion around it that this could include any kind of uh, ecologically relevant digital information especially the more that it includes local knowledge um, the more that the Nagoya protocol may apply and what, what is your perspective on that? How to increase our data sharing um, while accounting for the relationships and the, the contributions that, that we need to account for and also paying attention to the legal framework? Well, very good point because there are communities which may be adversely affected. One of the things that we have been trying to do in GEO, for example, is to actively include for example, the indigenous community. In fact, just before this talk, we are holding this week a GEL indigenous communities uh, summit, which basically uh, essentially communities leaders from the Arctic, from the Amazon, from Africa, from the United States, and these are community leaders uh, from the indigenous tribes are highlighting and showcasing what are they using Earth observation for? Essentially, of course, to understand what's happening to their environment. And this is a classic case of empowerment, uh, which means that there cannot be sharing in one way. And this is one of the issues that traditionally you say, oh, I share my in situ data with you when you do whatever you want. And if there is the sharing does not come back uh, to empower the person who actually did the sharing, uh, we have an ethical problem here. So this is something used in Brazil, we used to have a term for this, this uh, helicopter gringo. So it was the gringos who would come to Brazil, drum in the helicopter, collect some samples, live it up, go back to the States and publish a paper. And, 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 and of course, this creates an enormous resentment and ethically is uh, highly questionable. So unless you have active measures for promoting empowerment, and we, we're just starting, and if you want, just type a group, earthobservations.org. I'll put a link on the chat to the Geo Indigenous Summit and those who are interested, because it's a serious matter. These communities are there, they have been affected, and somehow disproportionately in some cases for climate change. And there's, and there's a lot that they can do using the right data. Amazing, amazing. It's you would never imagine, but they have such an understanding. Uh, it's the kind of geography of the mind, right? The, the mind, uh, their mind works differently because of their understanding of space. And when they see satellite data, their understanding of space is heightened to a to a, to a level that we that live in villages and big cities uh, cannot just gather. It's amazing. I've seen examples which are humbling. So it's absolute, without empowerment, without, without a many way street, it's, it's, it's ethically irresponsible. Hello everyone, thank you very much. Um, so we will not be able to ask all the questions of the publics, um, but we have asked, um, selected two of them. And first question is for the whole panel. Um, could you also give us some information about how the scientific insights are used to drive also actual change on the ground, be it, be it policy change, citizens engagement, awareness program, or others? Good question, I mean, You would force me into my favorite territory, which is the Amazon. Okay, uh, essentially, uh, like I said, the Pope, uh, the joke I'm saying is that you may seen last year, Pope Francis said about the Amazon is burning. And uh, he was referring to the data that is produced in INPI in my alma mater in the institution I was at, because that's the data that comes and you see in the Guardian, in the Guardian, in Le Temps, in the 
Le Monde, the New York Times, is this the authoritative data which is produced by the scientists in my institute. So the joke is the following. There are millions, uh, hundreds of millions of people that believe on the Pope, but there are very few people who can claim that the Pope believes in them. And we are some of the people that the Pope believes in them because the Pope was saying that Amazon is already using our data. Now, that is interesting because that data is completely open, completely transparent. Everything about it, the images, the polygons, the software, everything is online. Uh, we have an online system about forest fires, an online system about deforestation acts, and everybody can consult them. Even this stupid government of Bolsonaro could not shut it down because there was such an outcry. Even the Supreme Court told him that this was a right, a constitutional right to transparency that had to be done. So there was, you know, uh, so this is an example. There are others. The geoglam is also an important example. We have other examples, but essentially it boils down to the simple fact. Transparency brings governance. In other words, if you're not completely transparent with the data, if the data is not fully available uh, in all ways, it's very difficult for it to influence governance. Uh, you know, uh, because people can always hide behind what they do, the others don't know. So this is, uh, this, to this extent, the considerations about uh, how best to do decision making in environmental matters have to be done in a transparent way. It's, uh, it's uh, that's like the real principle. Citizens have the right to understand what's happening in their environment. And it's only with that information that they could, uh, they can influence by opinion, by public opinion, by voting, by whatever means, uh, the decisions of the government. You know, it's, it's, it's a way that, that society actually forces government to do things, not otherwise. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is quite interesting because it's uh, potentially controversial. So it's a question for, for the three of you, uh, whoever wants, wants to answer uh, from our audience. So how can we justify storing huge amounts of Earth observation data considering its environmental impact uh, in the fight, in the context of the fight against climate change? And I'll, I'll maybe add to the question that it's not just storing the data, but it's also the computational cost of um, processing, analyzing it. I think we, we have to, uh, like always, as I'm a scientist, you know, it's a famous story. In God we trust, all others please bring data. So my point here is, uh, my, to this question, I would say, where's the data? Where's the data and how much is this? I mean, how much is this? And if it's the case, let's, let's make the calculations. How many trees in the Amazon forest uh, in terms of emissions, does it correspond to the Amazon, uh, to, the actor, to the other Amazon AWS services? Let's make the calculations. If I can say, if, uh, I mean, we, let's just simple calculation uh, this year, the stupid government of Bolsonaro had uh, uh, 13,000, no, yeah, 13,000 uh, square kilometers of forest deforested in one year. Uh, when we had a good government, we had four. So it's, we're talking about 9,000 square kilometers uh, in one, you know, which could have been avoided, even more that could have been avoided. How much is this in CO2 and how much is this compares to what the Amazon, uh, the other Amazon, the Amazon Web Services use? So my question is not only how much you're spending on it and how much you're saving. And, and, and I think that the, please give me some data and how much, for example, has uh, your use of a supercomputer uh, used of energy and uh, compared to how much has this influenced uh, the decision-making about the Paris Agreement, how much we saved. Let's make the calculations. I mean, we have to, we cannot just argue by argument's sake. Please provide the data and then we argue. 
If I can add, so there is a kind of responsibility being a data science in, in early observation. So of course, we need to always be aware of like training the right models and think beforehand what you're, we're doing and not just training random models just to test, test whatever parameter configuration will make sense. I mean, this is already saving a lot of energy and data and storage. Then as Gilberto was saying, I mean, it, of course, it implies using resources, but at the end of the day, if we manage to really make a change, we save a lot on the long run. So in, in the end, even though there is a, some usage of resources, the, the primary goal is to solve a problem that will cost much, much more in the long run. So I don't know how much this justifies, but at the same time, I think we also need to keep into a, in, my, in mind the, the final objective. And as a final point, I remember attending a, a conference of the World Bank about carbon footprints. And there was this person from one of the big tech companies, maybe not the better to not to name the person, <laughs> but the person made an estimation, like trying to, to train some models, making global predictions with remote sensing data. And um, the model was sufficiently small to, to kind of show that the energy consumption was not as as crazy as people will, were initially thinking, but this, this needs to be verified like in a more rigorous manner. I, would, yeah, I, I think would, we, we, yeah, go ahead, please go ahead. I would just very briefly add that uh, first of all, just general comments because I'm not well informed about any of the numbers that would go into this calculation, but um, one, I think it's always very dangerous to assume a steady state. Um, so I, I would just emphasize this, that uh, we can rather assume that, uh, that society is always changing and technology is always moving. And it's a mistake to assume that the trade-offs that we perceive today are um, accurate in the future and, and maybe even tomorrow. And two, I, I would say that it's about investment. Um, and I think that this is just a different way of, of phrasing what's already been said, but it doesn't hurt to make the point a third time that it's a question what we want to invest in. You always have to initially invest resources to get a return. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Lorraine, do we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Go, go ahead. Maybe Emmanuel or, or Charlotte, I don't know which one of you wants to take the mic. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I do have one last question. So um, according to, to, to the discussion we, we had, it seemed that we have enough data from satellites. So do you think we need further work on increasing the quality? And if yes, uh, in which sense? Mary, maybe Meredith, you can start answering the question. Well, I, I've come from a background. Um, I'm very interested in small things. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in things that are, are so small that they can't be seen with the naked eye, but I'm also interested in individual organisms and what individuals do. And I think that a lot of ecologists are um, because to understand evolution, uh, to understand fitness and to understand adaptation, you have to understand in some way what individuals are doing. And so I think that we don't have enough data from satellites. In which kind of data would you need more? Well, it's easy for me to make requests because I'm very new to remote sensing. So <laughs> I am uh, still largely ignorant of, of many of the limitations, but I would love to have data at such a high resolution um, that I could interpret the, the actions, dynamics and, and movements of individuals. And um, I don't know if, if I know that it's possible for trees, <laughs> but um, I don't know if it will ever be possible for insects, for example. But I would also like to have more knowledge um, going into um, the, I, I hesitate to, to say the design, um, but certainly the interpretation of the data. Um, I, I believe that uh, from, my background in chemistry that also having higher spectral resolution and having more um, electromagnetic bands available um, would in some cases make up uh, for limitations on spatial resolution to be able to better um, interpret signals, for example, that are being exchanged between organisms or um, 
chemical mediators that we know are indicative of relationships that may be physically too small for us to observe from satellites.